My name is Jeff Tumlin, uh, and just as Mariala confessed to being an addict of places, I'm here to confess that I was born in Los Angeles, and I am an addict of cars. I got my driver's license on the day of my 16th birthday. I saved all of my money to buy my first car at the age of 17. Um, I still own a car, and I love driving it. And as a motorist, I also recognize the great pleasure of finding the movie star parking space, the Merrill Lemon Road, the Tibby Hedron. Um, we know this parking space, and there are few greater pleasures in a motorist life than finding that great empty parking space. But as somebody who's interested in building great cities, um, somebody who's interested in the health and wealth of cities, I also recognize that every empty parking space is a wasted $30,000. Parking is expensive, and while it is a terrible thing to provide not enough parking in our communities, it's an even worse thing to provide too much. One of the things that I do when I go to work in other cities around the country is compare the amount of space uh, parking space takes up compared to other land uses. Uh, and I tease my clients by charting out in their zoning codes how many square feet of parking is required per square foot of land use. And note to them that if you're requiring more than three spaces per thousand square feet, you're requiring more parking area than building area. And in most of our communities, um, those zoning codes result in places that look like this. And I don't even know where this is. This could be anywhere, because this is our American tradition of building, what our finest minds have produced in our regulations, and indeed, this is mixed-use development. There's uh, some very high-end office. Uh, here's some shopping. That's a hotel. This is some residential over here. Um, and they looked up in the ITE parking generation manual exactly how much parking needs to be provided for each of these uses and came up with the perfect number. But you can see if you lived or you worked here. If you worked there and wanted to go to lunch at this restaurant here across the street, you are probably going to get in your car and drive there. If you lived across the street at that housing and worked uh, across the street, you would probably also drive. This is a terrible situation of the unintended consequences of the perfect being the enemy of the good. We also have a tendency not to realize how much parking costs and how it impacts housing affordability. So a parking space, including its drive aisle, takes up about 300 square feet. That's about the size of a small studio apartment. Two parking spaces, it's the same as a one-bedroom apartment, and interestingly, costs almost the same to build. So in cities like San Francisco, we find that for every parking space you add to a residential unit, you increase the cost of that unit by about 15 to 30 percent, and you decrease the number of units that you can build in a typical lot by about 15 to 25 percent. Parking has a profound impact on housing affordability, and it has an impact on auto ownership rates. Fannie Mae tells us that for every household that can get rid of just one car, that's enough savings to be able to pay for an additional $100,000 in mortgage. Parking also has a strong relationship with traffic congestion. Because we all want that perfect Tippy Hedron parking space, um, in most downtowns, even small town main streets around the country, you can figure about 30% of that traffic is people just driving around in circles looking for that front door parking space. Um, and that, according to the law of congestion, even the most gridlocked situation, if you get rid of just 10% of the traffic, traffic flows smoothly again. Mismanaging parking is the worst thing that we can do for traffic congestion and the easiest thing that we can solve. Another thing that I find as I work all over the country is parking literally drives us crazy. My most smart, good government libertarian clients become rabid Soviet communists on the topic of parking. Forcing, you know, the, where the public sector comes in and forces the private market to produce a, a fixed supply of parking and then deliver it free to customers. 
Parking is the only commodity, apparently, in our society where the laws of supply and demand do not apply and where government has to have more interference in any topic or commodity other than pharmaceuticals. My, my bleeding heart liberal uh, clients also, when I you know, talk about good management of parking, wring their hands and say, oh, but if we charge for parking, where will the poor people park? So, I don't understand why parking uh, creates such cognitive dissonance, but I do know some solutions, and solutions that apply in all scales of community. I'm going to run through uh, 15 of them very quickly. Firstly, residential parking permits. They are anti-market and anti-democratic, but they're oftentimes a required first step for thinking about real management of parking, particularly in our college campuses and in our main streets and at our downtowns. You need to protect the hysteria of potential NIMBYs who stop good parking management for fear of spillover parking into their neighborhoods. Give them uh, something so that um, you can minimize their complaints. How many of you know when and where the first parking meter was installed? <laughs> Oklahoma City, 1935, Carl McGee. Parking meters are a great technology, and they, they allow us to apply market principles to managing uh, supply and demand. Um, but if your parking meter only accepts quarters, you're basically killing your market for parking. It's as if any uh, uh, store on your main street were to only accept quarters for you know, buying a cup of coffee, that store would go out of business. All parking meters need to accept forms of payment that people are carrying on their person. I'm not carrying any quarters. There is no excuse for parking meters to not accept credit cards and debit cards. And there is no excuse for your parking meter not to call you up and ask you if you want more time on your cell phone. Because why punish people for spending more time than they thought they were going to spend in your downtown? Why would we literally criminalize people for doing exactly what you want them to do? The next thing is to recognize that parking is really expensive, and it is almost always cheaper to invest in technology to help motorists find those hidden empty parking spaces than it is to build new parking spaces. Technology has come a long way. Apply it to the parking industry. The fourth point, and this one is really the most important, it is to recognize that market principles apply to parking just as they do to food, to housing, to utilities, to your cell phone bill. The right price for parking is always the lowest price at which a few spaces are always available on every block and every parking lot and every garage. The right price is the lowest price that achieves about a 15% availability target. We know this for every other good in society. We need to know this and understand it for parking. It also means, then, that the price for parking needs to vary by location. Parking on Main Street, a lot more expensive than parking two blocks away. It also needs to vary by time. And if you have a weekend entertainment and restaurant district, like in downtown Pasadena, California, the parking meter time needs to extend till midnight on Fridays and Saturdays. It also doesn't say anywhere in Leviticus that parking needs to be free on Sundays. <laughs> parking is free on Sundays because your city has not updated its parking code since 1958 when stores were closed on Sundays. Once you start par charging for parking, though, you need to be cognizant that most people will think you are an evil, money-grubbing bastard. And so you need to be clear about where that net revenue is going to and very consciously invest it. Pasadena, California, which Don Shoup has written a lot about, um, spends 100% of its net parking meter revenue in the downtown where that revenue is generated, allowing them to steam clean their sidewalks every night and make it one of the most successful commercial districts in all of Los Angeles County. You also need to be flexible about your use of parking spaces. Sometimes parking isn't the highest and best use of a parking space. Uh, in uh, Mountain View, California, the city allows restaurateurs to commandeer the parking spaces in front of their restaurants for outdoor seating um, when they're open and during seasons in which that makes sense. Um, and then it reverts to parking at off hours. Once you implement these basic, simple parking management tasks, the next thing that you can do as a government agency is get out of the business of over-regulating parking. 
There is no need for government to force developers to build more parking spaces than the market would warrant, except to avoid managing the public resource of parking. If you're managing parking correctly, the market will know the right number of parking spaces to build. The market will certainly build plenty of parking if you eliminate minimum parking requirements. It's not like no parking will be built. Plenty of parking will be built, but the right amount rather than an excessive amount. Um, in fact, cities all over the United States of all different sizes have started eliminating their minimum parking requirements and replacing those parking requirements with maximums, recognizing that there's no point in providing more parking than uh, you've got roadway capacity to get to that parking, and also recognizing that too much parking is really destructive to the sort of walkable, equitable, attractive, livable city that previous speakers have spoken so much about. Very critically, design your parking well. I don't understand why parking structures need to be so hideous. They're not that much different than any other building. You can wrap them in retail. You can design them like an attractive building. They don't have to be ugly. In fact, they should never be ugly. Be very cautious about driveways. Uh, this parking garage here uh, provide, met the minimum parking requirement off street, but it did so by wiping out the same number of parking spaces on street, achieving no net good and making the entire street experience really unpleasant. Very importantly, unbundle the cost of parking from the cost of housing. Do not require that all tenants of your, of your building come with exactly 2.0 parking spaces. Allow families with more cars to have a place to put them, and allow families with fewer cars to be able to save money and be able to buy more housing uh, in exchange for having fewer cars. Always separate out the price of uh, parking from the price of housing. Allow and encourage uh, parking to be more efficient in terms of mechanical lift parking, illegal in most communities, valet parking, discouraged in many places for no good reason. And uh, also share parking um, by, um, by promoting car share services, which um, up until the last couple of years have been largely the province of much more urban places. But now with the advent of peer-to-peer -peer car sharing like um, uh, Get Around, um, are possible in cities the size of Norman, Oklahoma. So sharing parking and encouraging that as part of your community is a phenomenally efficient way to get more out of your parking spaces. So pulling this all together, um, one of the, um, the ways in which we can design communities being smart about parking is to recognize, first of all, the flaws of how we're doing cities currently. So this is some horrible arterial. There are many uh, in this region. You know where they all are. And currently, along those arterials, you've got different land uses, and each of those land uses has its own parking lot. And you'll notice the parking lot is built bigger than the building. So imagine your daily life for many of you. You drive, you drop your daughter off at school, that requires a parking space, then you go to work, and then you've got to go pick your daughter up to take her to soccer practice because she can't get across the ugly arterial. And then you go and you shop, and that's another parking space, then you go and you pick your daughter up, and then you go home. and you know, compressed, but this is many of our daily lives. And you'll notice that not only is that a lot of traffic, it's a lot of turning movements off of the big arterial. Now imagine instead that you had that same arterial, and like in downtown Norman, you had a grid of streets oriented off the arterial, and you arrange your land uses on that grid of streets, main street fashion, you put the parking behind, and you had these different land uses share parking, because they're peaking at different times of the day. Now imagine the same trip. So you drive, you park, your daughter can now get herself to school while you go to work, and she can get herself to soccer practice because she no longer has to get across the ugly arterial. You can get your uh, errands done during your lunch break, you can meet at the car, and you can go home. Exactly the same trip, the same land uses, but dramatically different results just from the way that we thought about land use and its relationship with parking. So same development, half of the parking, half the land area, or twice as much economic development opportunity per acre. One quarter of the arterial trips, a sixth of the arterial turning movements, and less than a quarter of the vehicle miles traveled. 75% reduction in traffic, just because we built a place and we shared parking and managed it well. 
This is easy. We know how to do it. This is exactly how every small town Main Street in Oklahoma works. And it's the opposite of how we're building communities today. Um, there's a whole chapter about this to provide more information along with a whole bunch of other material in my book. You're welcome to read it, and we'll be doing some questions afterward. Thank you.